today i'll be presenting on points of departure begum a tool for analyzing gender relations political agency and affluence of mool jahan so in the empire issuing points was the royal prerogative of the king or the sovereign and in the course of the late 16th and 17th centuries the moguls evolved a highly centralized notion of kingship within a patriarchal framework uh however it is during the same time that we see noor jahan emerging as an exception that is the only woman or queen in the history of the moguls who have issued coins in her name thus a lot of scholars have used this uh, the title of co-sovereign for her now the aim of this research was to study coins as both an object of analysis as well as a means or tools of or tool of conducting further analysis therefore the purpose of this research is firstly to present a comprehensive analysis of the coins of noor jahan on the basis of materiality text and image secondly to see how these coins can be used as a tool of analyzing and understanding the political and economic agency of noor jahan in the context of gender relations within the patriarchal institutions of the mughal empire uh, so to give a brief theoretical framework Uh, a coin can be defined as a piece of metal with a standard weight backed up by an authority and largely accepted by people uh, therefore it links its source to link different levels of the society as sources of history coins are both historical and archaeological in nature uh, so the primary function of the coins as you know is an economic one that is they act as medium of exchange however they also serve social political aesthetic and commemorative functions among many others uh, as a result coins acquire an agency of their own that is they become the means of disseminating knowledge influencing ideas and instruments of achieving certain goals uh, therefore throughout history they have been appropriated by the issuing authorities as states or states as symbols of sovereignty and the moguls were no exception to the same Now the Mughal Empire, as we all know, was founded by Zaheer bin Muhammad Babur. See, the empire reached its zenith under the successive reigns of Akbar, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, and Aurangzeb. Akbar is credited with having established much of the centralized machinery to run the administration of the empire and its reputation as an all-powerful state, both within the Indian subcontinent as well as abroad. Now this period the late 16th and the 17th centuries witnessed an increased commercial activity and movement of people goods and money across uh, across the subcontinent so maritime trade routes connected in the new world to europe and asia and a lot of huge amounts of bullion flowed within the indian subcontinent due to the favorable balance of trade and this bullion is very important as it was the primary source of minting coins during the mughal period so now the level of monetization achieved by the mughals was unprecedented in the history of the indian subcontinent uh, the imperial currency flowed freely from kabul to dhaka and from surat to madras now akbar introduced a lot of monetary reforms and is credited with having established uh the mobile currency system which remained uh, relatively unchanged until the very end of the dynasty so imperial mints were located in every province to meet the needs of the currency and uh, it was highly centralized with a mechanism to control the quality and purity of coins so uh the mobile currency was trimetallic that is it consisted of gold mohurs silver rupees and copper dams uh now the gold mohurs they primarily served as a uh, treasure or or pieces while the silver was the standard unit of exchange and copper down facilitated small scale transactions uh now few changes were introduced by akbar and jahangir in their own reigns so one important uh, change that that akbar introduced uh was the ilahi era on the coins which was based on the solar calendar instead of the lunar in 1584 ce when jahangir came to power he introduced three more changes firstly he ordered the weight of both gold and silver coins to be increased by 20% in the 13th year of his reign he replaced the month of the issue with an image of the constellation which belonged to that month 
And lastly, and most importantly, in the year 1623 CE, Jahangir issued both gold and silver coins bearing the name of Noor Jahan, which continued till the end of his reign in 1627 CE. So Noor Jahan Begum, or formerly known as Mehrunissa, was born in the Persian household of Mirza Yaz Beg in the year 1577 CE. Now Mirza Yaz Beg was an emigre from Iran and served the Mughal Emperor Akbar. And over a period of time, he rose in he rose in position and status. And by the time of Jahangir, he became the financial minister or the Divan, one of the most uh, highest offices uh, in the Mughal court. So Noor Jahan was uh, Akbar organized her marriage with Sher Afghan in 1594 CE, and both of them were posted in Mughal. After the death of Sher Afghan, Noor Jahan joined the Mughal harem. And in 1611 CE, Jahangir saw in the New Year's feast and married her on 25th May of the same year. Now, over a period of time, Jahangir conferred several titles on Noor Jahan. So, beginning with the title Noor Mehen in 1611 CE, then he gave the title Badshah Begum in 1614 CE. Uh, this was followed by the title Noor Jahan, that is Light of the World, in 1616 CE. Now, it is important for us to note over here that the title Noor is related to Jahangir's own title, that is Nuruddin, which is in turn related to the cult of divine light initiated by Akbar in his own reign. And it thus reflected the association of Noor Jahan with the imperial authority. Um, so, a number of primary texts and Jahangir's memoirs, that is, Tuzuki Jahangiri, talk about Noor Jahan, and Jahangir speaks very fondly of her. So, in the year, in the 13th year, in, that is in 1622 CE, Jahangir mentions that on the first of the divine month of Iskandar means I gave the establishment and everything belonging to the initiative of Itamadat Nur Jaha Begum that the drum and orchestra should be sounded after those of the king. So when Jahan, uh, when Nur Jaha's father, uh, Itamad Dola, passed away, Jahangir gave the office of uh, Itamad Dola to Nur Jaha. So he, he also conferred a lot of other privileges on Nur Jaha, which included uh, the performance of Jiroka Darshan and Sainalmas or Edicts. Now, both of these symbolized sovereignty in spatial and ritualistic spheres, and they included a public display of power and authority that were otherwise the sole uh, pre uh, pre uh, privilege of the king. So, uh, now this was perceived the power and authority that Nur Jahan. Uh, had in the Mughal court was perceived in very different ways by both the Mughal nobility as well as the foreign travelers and a lot of contemporary, uh, contemporary and later literature talk about her in different lights. So here you can see, so this is an excerpt from the remonstranti of Francisco Pelsa, a Dutch factor who visited the Mughal court during the reign of Jahangir. So he says that Jahangir, disregarding his own person and position, has surrendered himself to a crafty wife of humble lineage as the result either of her arts or of her persuasive tongue. She has taken and still continues to take such advantage of this opportunity that she has gradually enriched herself with superabundant treasures and has secured a more than royal position. Most of the men who are near the king owe the promotion to her and are consequently under such obligation to her that Jahangir is king in name only. So now these sentiments or, you know, describing Noor Jahan as a crafty wife or, 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 you know, humble lineage as, an, as a secret of opportunity is found among many other uh, texts of the same period, such as those of Thomas Rowe, Edward Terry, Pietro de la Valle, as well as later chronicles which were produced during the reign of Shah Jahan, such as Iqbal Nama. So all these narratives have influence the way the nationalist scholars and the colonials and Europeans for that matter have perceived both Jahangir and Noor Jahan. Jahangir is seen as a weak and passive ruler and Noor Jahan is seen as a cunning and crafty wife. So it is important to note that these literary texts uh, mentioned above uh, were always written with a certain bias and political motives. 
Therefore, a heavy reliance on these texts to construct a historical narrative has led uh, uh, these biases to get populated and repeated at multiple levels in the present scholarship as well. Therefore, I propose that points as both an archaeological and historical um, sources are very important to shed light on, on these issues. So, coming to the points of Nur Jaha, we basically come across two major types of points. First is the couplet type, that is, points with couplets on both of birth and reverse sides, with the year of the issue and the name of the mint mentioned. Uh, second type of points we have are the zodiacal points, which consist of 12 points, that is, 12 points representing the 12 zodiac signs that we have, each with a different constellation on the obverse and a couplet on the reverse. Uh, now, this is basically what uh, the zodiac, so, uh, zodiac points look like. Uh, this is the coin of Emperor Jahangir. Uh, I could not locate the zodiac points of Mu Jaha uh, because we are very few in numbers. And But a few of them were uh, uh, mentioned and the images were there in old museum catalogs. So this is basically what they look like. Um, Coming to the couplet points of Nujah, which, uh, which are of particular importance to us. So, as you can see, uh, this image is of the silver coin and this one is of gold. Uh, so, the material which was used to issue uh, Nujah's coins was gold and silver and not copper. The standard used was tola and one tola is equal to 180 grains, that is 11.3 grams. Uh, the weight of the coins was similar to those of the imperial coins of Jahangir, that is 180 to 188 grains for gold and 178 grains for the silver coins. Now, ornamentation. Uh, the coins of each metal employed a distinctive aesthetic with the gold mohurs having the finest calligraphy and workmanship, followed by silver rupees and finally the copper downs. The inscriptions on coins were written in Persian and the calligraphic style used was mostly Nephthalic, although the Tugra style was also used at times. The coins also contain certain markers which have been described as ornamentation. These small forms and patterns include flower and leaf, mo leaf motifs, dots among many others, uh, and they're interspersed on the surface of the coin. Uh, now the exact purpose of these markers remains uncertain. And C.J. Brown, however, suggests that these marks or symbols may have had served as a device or an instrument to prevent and identify forgeries, or each particular symbol could have been associated with a particular mint or a particular region as well. So now if you compare the craftsmanship of the gold and silver coins of Nucha, you can see the difference. Now these are the ornamentation that I'm, you know, the markers that I'm talking about these flower and leaf motifs, um, which are much more finely and intricately executed on the gold coin as compared to the silver. So coming to the inscriptions of the coin, uh, found on the coins, so there is uh, a basic, um, there's a basic couplet and a few variations on, of the same couplet. And each couplet um, is a bit different from mint to mint. Uh, that different couplets for different ways. So the first couplet, if you see, by order of Shah Jahangir, gold has a hundred splendors added to it by receiving the impression of the name of Nur Jahan Badsha Begum. Second couplet, from the name of Shah Jahangir, the face of the coin of Lahore has become full of light. It has been increased by the addition of the name of Nur Jahan. And third couplet, by order of Shah Jahangir, the coin of Lahore, by name of Nur Jahan Badsha, became full of light. So all of these couplets have one thing in common, that is they start by the name of Shah Jahangir or King Jahangir, and then we talk about Nur Jahan as Badsha Begum. So as you can see in this coin, which is from Lahore Museum, it is a silver coin from the mint of Agra. So on the obverse, the couplet reads, Bahukum Jahangir Shah Sad Zebariya, uh, 1037, that is by authority of Judge Shah Jahangir, gold gained a hundred beauties, and on the reverse it reads, 
similarly this is another silver coin from the mint of lahore and it reads the same thing by order of king jahangir gained 100 beauties gold by the name of king jahan bachcha now what what inferences can we draw from uh, the points or the points that I have discussed above? So by looking at the choice of material, that is uh, gold and silver and not copper. So it is in a way reflective of a political and economic agency as well as a special status which is at once imperial in nature but also limited in the sense that it did not penetrate the local society and economy or facilitate small scale transactions, unlike the copper coins of Jahangir. So, the, uh, Jahangir has his name on both gold, copper, and silver coins. However, no Jahan's coins are restricted only to gold and silver coins. Um, talking about the images, so minting coins with images of constellations which were meant both as tokens and for circulation among the masses, reflects the ideas and values endorsed by the issuers and the conscious efforts for the creation of a self-image which appears to be imbibed with the traditions of the subcontinent and not those of the Islamic law of Sharia. So this marks a decisive break uh, from the Islamic tradition because uh, representing pictures is something that is prohibited uh, in the Islamic tradition and uh, this is where we see Jahangir and Nurjahan innovating. So, from the couplets or inscriptions, we uh, we know that couplets are public pro uh, proclamations of sovereignty as well as a means of disseminating knowledge among the masses. This, along with the contemporary nature of coins as a source of history, makes them important for understanding the notion of sovereignty as projected to the masses situated away from the court. The titles used on these coins reflect the imperial status of both Jahangir and Nur Jahan, and hence Nur Jahan has been called a co sovereign by civil scholars. So we have seen how the title Bacha Begum appears on the coins. Uh, and this is what has been used to construct the narrative of her as being a co sovereign. However, coins tell us about the source of her sovereignty and thus the nature of the sovereignty itself. This is one point which has been overlooked by most of the scholarship. So not only, so if you look at how the inscriptions have been constructed, they begin by the name of Jahangir and it tells how by the order of Jahangir, coin has attained a hundred duties by adding the name of Nur Jahangir. So not only is this reflective of the status of Nur Jahan vis a -vis Jahangir, which is not equal because, of course, Jahangir is projecting himself as the source of authority and sovereignty of Nur Jahan. Uh, uh, but it also essentially means that the king or Jahangir is still the absolute source of all power and authority. Despite having issued coins jointly with Nur Jahan, Jahangir still makes his status as the sovereign very clear. So, Placing Nur Jahan in the larger context of the royal women of the Mughal household uh, because this will help us understand where all she stands out and uh, what were the conditions that made her rise possible. So Mughal household retained certain aspects of its, of its Turko-Mongol ancestry well into the 17th century. This largely pertains to the mobility of the Mughal court as well as the, sub sub the subsequent forest boundaries between the harem and the court. The women of the Mughal household did enjoy a status which was quite unequal when compared to the contemporary Ottoman and Safavid empires. They were educated, they patronized arts, they, commi uh, they commissioned construction of large buildings and gardens, they organized festivities and events, and also intercepted uh, from time to time and were consulted for various political issues. Therefore, they were very much present in public spaces, actively engaging in a wide array of activities, particularly in the court, which is otherwise seen as a male-dominated uh, male dominated space. Economically, the royal women engaged in commercial activities and actively participated in the trade with the Europeans, and some owned their own ships or junks, uh, and Noor Jahan did own her uh, own junk, in which plied in, in, on the western coast of the Indian subcontinent. Uh, they were also assigned their own jagirs for their maintenance and had 
a retinue of their own divans and vakils and officers to facilitate them with the administration. And the title of Bacha Begum, which is so uniquely associated with Noor Jahan, was in fact not unique to her, as this title and similar titles had been given to royal ladies, such as Khan Sada Begum during the reign of Mayu, as well as to Jahanara, the daughter of Shah Jahan. So, placing Noor Jahan in this context uh, does reveal a lot about her status and how, and how it has been constructed. So there were certain similarities, uh, but what makes her exceptional is the magnitude or the scale of uh, the kind of authority she yielded. So uh, if we look at the location of the mints of Noor Jahan, uh, which were used to issue her coins, uh, they included Surat, Ahmedabad, Lahore, Agra, Akbar Nagar, Patna, Kashmir and Delhi. Out of these, Ahmedabad, Surat, Pajna and Akbarabad were the largest in terms of output and the relative importance of mints was in turn determined by their commercial significance as having been located along the trade routes or, in, on, in, or having you know, some strategic or political significance. Therefore, the choice of mints used to issue the coins of Noor Jahan is equally telling about her economic and political agents. So, uh, I'll just briefly give you all a background of the War of Succession and how the different narratives came to be built around Noor Jahan and Jahangir. So, uh, when Jahangir's health deteriorated towards the end of his reign, a lot of anxiety and uh, anxiousness mounted uh, within the Mughal court as to who would succeed Jahangir as the next king. So, now Noor Jahan had a daughter by uh, her former husband, that is Sher Afghan, Khan, uh, Ladli Begum. And Noor Jahan tried to marry Ladli Begum to the future kings. That is how she tried to control and manipulate the politics, uh, especially during the war of succession. Now, uh, Noor Jahan married her daughter, first tried to marry her daughter to Kisro, but he did not marry her. And then subsequently, uh, she married her daughter to the youngest son of King Jahangir, uh, that is Prince Shahriyar. Now, this was seen as an act of offence by uh, Prince Kudram or the future Shah Jahan, and this led to a lot of political tension between Noor Jahan and Shah Jahan. So, of course, we all know that uh, Jahan, uh, Shah Jahan succeeded the throne. Uh, however, a lot of anecdotes and stories then circulated. Uh, among the people in the markets and, you know, in places about the entire war of succession and Noor Jahan's role in it. So, Straso Tavernier, a French uh, traveler during the time of, um, you know, 16, he, he came to again 1656-1657 CE. So, he records an important anecdote in his uh, travelogue. So, he says that, um, to perpetuate her memory, Noor Jahan planned the issue of a coin of unique design with her name on one side and a zodiac sign on the other. To execute the same, she waited till her two political adversaries, that is Prince Khusro and Khurram, were no longer a threat as the former had been blinded and the latter had been posted at Tekken. So when both of them were away, she persuaded Jahangi to allow her to be the ruler for 24 hours in his stead. Uh, and she was already prepared and had sent bullion and dice to all the minting cities to issue coins in her name. So once Jahangir granted the permission, she sent messengers to mint masters to issue gold and silver coins uh, amounting to the value of 2 million and within 2 hours of her enthronement, she distributed these coins among the people. On hearing about this incident, Prince Kurram became furious and on ascending the throne in 1628 CE, he prohibited the circulation of these coins and melted them down. So this is the anecdote that Franco Bernier um, narrates in his travelogue and uh, we all know that this is actually incorrect because uh, no such thing ever happened that you know, Noor Jahan became a king for 24 hours. But this also tells us a lot about the popular perception of Noor Jahan and Jahangir that was there during the reign of uh, Shah Jahan and which had an impact over the subsequent narrations around the same. So, uh, here with, with this anecdote, we see the rise of the narrative of uh, Noor Jahan as 
a crafty wife of humble lineage or um, you know a very cunning usurper of power emerging and jahangir as increasingly a weak and passive ruler this is also because shah jahan when he came to power he wanted to legitimize his authority uh, he wanted to legitimize his position as the king so while he relegated he tried to relegate jahangir to the background uh, he directed his um, you know his ire towards nur jahan because he apparently could not directly question his father so so he made deliberate efforts to control the narrative of his court histories to you know uh, remove the accomplishments or memory of nur jahan as she was accused of having caused much political instability in the empire during 1620s Uh, for her own selfish gains now central to this construction was the uh, central to the construction of these narratives was uh, the the act of issuing coins in the name of nur jahan as um, jahangir as shah jahan thought for this as an infringement of the royal prerogative and infringement of uh the sovereignty of the king and thus he perceived nur jahan as a threat uh so when he came to power shah jahan pro- prohibited the use and circulation of nur jahan's coins and um this is how several uh, anecdotes and stories came to be in place so to conclude firstly the coins as symbols of sovereignty serve as a tool for understanding the nature source projection and perception of this sovereignty this in turn elucidates the nature and extent of political and economic agency of the issuer which in this case is nur jahan based on the material of me as well as the couplets inscribed on the coins the sovereignty claimed by nur jahan appears to be limited as compared to that of jahangir whose name still continues to be the source of all power and authority within the empire now this transfer of sovereignty uh, was a long drawn process and indeed was never realized in absolute terms now what do i mean by this if you look at the entire trajectory of uh, the events so nur jahan's association with imperial power or sovereignty began with the title nur mahal being conferred on her which was in 1611 ce and it is over a period of time that we see uh you know certain privileges being conferred on her and it was never realized in absolute terms what i mean by this is that while certain prerogatives were indeed endowed on nur jahan but two of them that is um reading her name in khutba and uh the inscription on the copper coins the, the inscription of her name on the copper coins uh was not done now uh Kutbas and uh, the copper coins—they were much more widely circulated among the local masses. And uh, here we see that her sovereignty was limited in the sense that it was centered around the court. The actual power that she wielded was in the court. So this was very much within the patriarchal structures of the empire and the theory of kingship. in this light a difference emerges between the theory and practice of the exercise of power by nur jahan while in theory jahangir never conferred absolute sovereignty on her or sovereignty which would make her his equal however in practice nur jahan does seem to have considerable power and influence as also is seen in the performance of court rituals uh, attached to her this difference therefore makes the title of co sovereign used for her problematic as it does not take into account the difference between theory and practice of sovereignty thus the agency exercised by nur jahan is at once exceptional but is but it is still very much within the overarching patriarchal institutions of the mughal kingship um therefore uh, in this context coins as a source of history become important because a heavy reliance on literary texts uh, has given rise to some biased narratives and in 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 such a case when we have so many literary uh, narratives or literary texts it becomes all the more important to look at other material sources particularly coins uh, before making any conclusions so with that i would like to conclude my presentation uh, here is the selected bibliography for 
uh, for this topic. And I would also like to thank Shriya Ma'am for constantly helping me and guiding me throughout this project.